your mother Green lady, we're covering today's top box of news Okay, we'll start with this an update to what was supposed to be the Kim Clavel versus Jessica Neri Plata light flyweight unification match. It was supposed to go down tomorrow night, Thursday, north of the border in Canada. Apparently, it's been postponed as a result of Kim Clavel falling ill. And they've moved the fight to early January. So we really won't have to wait all that long to see it come into fruition. They were Johnny on the spot with the fight. Though you have to question, if Kim Clavel has fallen ill, will that in any way, shape, or form affect her? Her readiness in January because this does seem to be a, a tougher assignment than the previous fight she had with the then champion Yesenia Gomez. Then WBC light flyweight champion Yesenia Gomez of Mexico, just like Jessica Neri Plata. Yesenia Gomez was a champion for a very long time. And you know, Kim Clavel bossed it. She thoroughly outboxed Yesenia Gomez, but this is a tougher assignment, I think, because Jessica Niri Plata is a bigger puncher than Yesenia, comparatively. Jessica Niri Plata is a little taller, I'd wager, a little stronger, so the strategy for her may have to be a little bit different than what we saw in the Gomez fight with Kim Clavel pulling out ill due to illness. You have to wonder if that could in any way, shape, or form affect her readiness in January, as that really only is a matter of weeks away. I mean, I still favor Kim Clavel to win the fight. I, I'd say comparatively, she's the better boxer, the more mobile fighter. Faster hands and faster feet, though perhaps not as durable and doesn't pack as big a wallop, as big a punch as Jessica Neri Plata does. In any event, they've moved the fight date to January 13th, so we have that to look forward to in the new year. It's down there at Light Flyweight, a few divisions north of Light Flyweight at Super Bantamweight, word around the campfire seems to be that France's own Sigeline Lafarve, unbeaten Sigeline Lafarve of France, she's been stripped of her WBA title due to her inability to defend it as a result of a hand injury. For those you might recall some weeks ago, I talked about it here on the channel, Sigeline Lafarve was supposed to be in action last month in October, but as a result of a hand injury, she was unable to compete and... I guess as a result of that, the WBO decided to strip her. And if this intel checks out, that would lower the number of reigning champions at 122 pounds from four down to three. Mexico's own reigning WBC champion, Jamie Mercado. Reigning WBA champion of Venezuela, Mayerling Rivas. And newly crowned IBF champion, New Zealand-born, Australian-based, Shernika Johnson. Sugar Neeks, who's currently under orders to defend the blue belt against her mandatory challenger of the United Kingdom. Kingdom, Nelly Scottney of Cotford. You wonder if this recent revelation may in any way, shape, or form affect the trajectory of young Ellie Scottney's career. Ellie's got a anchor in a fight for an alphabet title. I personally think it's a bit too soon for the Sugar Neeks fight. Uh, maybe with a vacant title lying around, they can pursue that while Ellie continues to amass more professional experience because she doesn't have a whole lot of fights, you understand. I believe she's 5-0 and or 6-0. and Sugar Neeks has more professional experience and, and she's a solid fighter, a cerebral one like Ellie, just with more rounds in the bank. It would be a very different fight than any fight that Ellie has had as a professional so far. Ellie's fought a lot of pressure fighters, a lot of aggressive fighters, but not many cerebral ones. Not any, if I'm being honest. You wonder if they won't decide to have Ellie fight for the newly vacated WBO title instead and forego the IBF route? Forego the IBF title fight that was mandated by the IBF. Forego the shirt Nika Johnson fight, or will they elect to move forward with the Johnson fight with the newly crowned WBO title attached to it, since it is available. The WBO themselves, they don't post rank standings for their female fighters, so we don't even know who's next in line for that WBO title. And if the WBO did in fact elect to strip Sigeline Lafarve of her title, I have to assume that whoever she was going to fight, it must have been her mandatory challenger. Otherwise, why would they have elected to strip her in the first place? It's a very sordid affair. That is, if the intel checks out, it probably will. And that's just me bouncing ideas around. If the WBO title is vacant, maybe Ellie might fight for it. Or perhaps Ramla Ali, yet another unbeaten up-and-comer by way of Matchroom, who was in action earlier this year. I'm pretty sure she'd like to fight for a title at some point. I don't get the sense they want to match Ramla against Ellie. I think they are on separate paths. In any event, we'll see who ends up picking up the newly vacated WBO title.
In men's super lightweight news, on the heels of his big win this past weekend, Regis Pregarius posted a video to his social media of the action from ringside, and to that, former unified lightweight champion Teofimo Lopez reacted by saying, you need to teach me how to be that slow. Oh my, I can't wait to eat next year. I won't fault young Teofimo Lopez's gamesmanship. That's basically how he, in many ways, talked himself into position to get that Lomachenko fight that he said that he wanted, the fight that he said that he'd win, and he did. You know, gamesmanship is a part of the sport after all. So I won't begrudge him his gamesmanship. However, it is big talk for somebody who got sat on their back pocket by a naturally smaller man and a lighter puncher in George Cambosos Jr. Listen, we can analyze the circumstances of that fight. Why was it that Teofimo Lopez was such a far cry from the fighter that we saw develop into a champion? We can do that, though. Ultimately, the outcome remains the same. If George dropped you and George beat you, what would Regis do? Because he's a bigger man and a bigger puncher than George by far and wide. And who says you even get to a Regis Pregarious fight? You've got Sandor Martin in front of you, a late replacement who's pulled the upset, the big upset, at least once before earlier this year against Mikey Garcia. Could he upset Teofimo Lopez? He's a very different guy than the guy you were initially supposed to fight. A very different guy than the guy you were initially preparing for. Jose Pedraza, who's still a capable fighter, but he's still a fighter on the back nine. Sandor isn't. You know, he didn't want to fight unbeaten Arnold Barboza, a guy who's been waiting to fight Teofimo Lopez since before he even moved up in weight. Says a lot that Sandor Martin wasn't their first choice. He was their second. A late replacement. You know, Teofimo Teofimo Lopez, he's a big talker. He's the kind of guy who likes to shoot off at the mouth. That's his persona as a pugilist. You know, some people like it. Some people go for that. Some people don't. Former unified lightweight champion George Kimbosos, he don't go for that. He says Teofimo can go fuck himself. Haney is a very special fighter. Addressing some recent comments that Teofimo Lopez made about Devin Haney. Devin Haney, who succeeded in beating George Kimbosos Jr. not once, but twice where Teofimo Lopez failed. In case Teofimo Lopez forgot. He must have, the way he's been carrying on. Between me and Teofimo, he can go fuck himself right now. Cambosos told Fight Hype. He's consistently been a spoiled brat. A guy that won't accept defeat. I beat his ass. I beat him up. That bad. I damaged him. None of his conspiracy theory bullshit. Where's the evidence? Show me the evidence. Keep crying. Keep talking. You know what? He'll never get his O back. I took it. Makes a valid point. More recently, Lopez denigrated Cambosos and Haney for the viewership they produced on ESPN. The fight was distributed in Australia as a pay-per-view event. Lopez is scheduled to return to the ring against Sandor Martin December 10th in the headline event at the Hulu Theater at Madison Square Garden in New York. The second Haney versus Cambosos fight didn't produce quite the same viewership as the first, but the viewing figures overall, they were robust, at least here in America. A little over a million the first time, and close to a million the second time. And bear in mind that they were going head-to-head -head with a pay-per-view that same night, Wilder's ring return. He carried on about me and Devin Haney's ESPN numbers, and he's got no idea the kind of pay-per-view numbers we did in Australia, Cambosos said. Some of that. It's funny, him and his dad, he doesn't even know what pay-per-view is. So I think he can disrespect whoever he wants. It shows. Of Devin Haney, Kimbosos had only high praise. George isn't wrong, you know. Teofimo Lopez hasn't debuted on pay-per-view yet. That's what the Lomachenko fight was supposed to be, but the pandemic hit and things were, needless to say, less than ideal. Now, I remember before Triller was found in default by the IBF and before Matchroom, ended up with the rights to the fight. Teofimo Lopez was afforded the option to do the show, to do the fight in Australia. And I remember that Teofimo and his team didn't want to do that. Perhaps if he had, the fight could have happened sooner. It wouldn't have been as much of a strain on him, you know, making that weight and staying at lightweight as long as he did. Who knows? Had he elected to do the fight in Australia, maybe he would have won. Maybe a better version of Teofimo Lopez would have showed up than the one that showed up at New York City when they did fight. Yeah, maybe. Maybe the cucumbers taste better pickled. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. If my aunt had a dick, she'd be my uncle. Ultimately, <laughs> this guy beat you. And that's reality. And Devin beat him. That's reality. Devin Haney is a special fighter, Camboso said. A very talented fighter. Like I said, I'm in his corner. I respect him. That thing with him is he's getting better and better. But already, what he has right now 
He's very good. Now I'll tell you what, Teofimo Lopez, and a part of the reason why his career gained traction is because he's a big trash talker. And trash talking in boxing, well, like I said, some people go for that stuff. Some people like it, some people don't. But what's consistent, whether you like trash talk or not, is you've got to back it up. Your trash talking reaches precarious, newly crowned WBC super lightweight champion. Your trash talking Devin Haney, undisputed lightweight champion. You're talking a lot of trash for a newbie to the weight a newbie to the super lightweight division. You're talking a lot of trash for a guy who's about to be opposite the ring, a short notice opponent, and Sandor Martin, who's upset the apple cart for a betting favorite before. Teofimo Lopez, I'm sure, is the betting favorite ahead of this fight. But the odds makers don't always tell a story. They don't always see it coming. If he loses to this guy, he's finished. Not because it'll be his second professional loss, but because psychologically, I don't think Teofimo could handle it. If I'm being honest, I don't think he's really over the George Cambosos loss. You remember after the fight, he had all sorts of conspiracy theories that Matchroom and DAZN set him up. Why would they set him up? Why would they do that? How would that have benefited them? They set up Teofimo Lopez so that he could lose to George, so that George and Devin could end up fighting on ESPN and not DAZN. Make it make sense. It doesn't, but here's what does. You're talking a lot of trash, and when you talk a lot of trash, whether people like it or not, you've got to back it up. He's coming up, he making up stuff right now. Like that dude, you know, that dude get the feeling himself and feeling like he's something that he's not in. And to the world, he look like a killer. But I can't wait. I'm gonna expose him. I'm gonna mm. expose him. I promise you, I'm gonna expose him. Watch. I'm gonna be the person to expose him. I'm gonna be the person to that 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 that. He going there. He not gonna knock out. He not gonna. Hurt. He got to go 12 rounds with somebody and, and somebody going to be beating him. He ain't going to like that shit. That shit going to mess with his heart. That shit mm. going to fuck with his head. Why? In my previous video, we talked about some statements from Gervonta Davis himself. Things he said that went on in sparring between him and Shakur, him and Devin. You know, that he's basically put hands on to both of them. That he's put hands on everyone. And the fighters themselves, Shakur and Devin jointly, they haven't taken kindly to any of this. Shakur Stevenson. Well, you heard what he said. There was a back and forth exchange on social media as well. Those latest comments come to us by way of fight hype. In a nutshell, Shakur wants to get him in the ring. Devin Haney does also, but I don't think they're going to have the same luck that Ryan Garcia might have. I've long maintained that there's a financial incentive in association with a Ryan Garcia fight that perhaps is not associated with a Shakur Stevenson fight or a Devin Haney fight. They're all sizable fights that would get a lot of attention, but I've long maintained that the Gervonta Davis people view Ryan Garcia as a more beatable fighter with a bigger financial incentive than the aforementioned two fighters. Thus, it's an ideal situation for them. If you're telling yourself that because we may be on the eve of Davis versus Garcia. If you're telling yourself that now that Javante Davis ain't with Leonard anymore, we might get those fights. If you're telling yourself this stuff, you know, that's a best case scenario. The reality of it is, even if Javante isn't with Leonard, he's still boxing on the Showtime platform exclusively. So there are still promotional hurdles to overcome, platform hurdles to overcome, and you tell yourself that, well, they overcame those hurdles for the Ryan Garcia fight. But did they? We haven't crossed the finish line yet. The next fight ain't with Ryan Garcia, it's with Hector Garcia. And even if he does end up sharing the ring with Ryan, if he makes it past Hector and he actually fights Ryan. Do you think that Javante Davis's handlers, whoever they might be at this point in the juncture, you think they keep the same energy for Shakur and Devin that they keep for Ryan? I told you, they likely view Ryan as a more beatable fighter that provides a bigger financial incentive. So for the Davis people, that's ideal. The least risks for the most rewards. That's how they might view Ryan. And they may not view Shakur and Devin in that same scope. For anybody who might be thinking that Gervonta Davis leaving Mayweather Promotions heralds this new age, this new era, this new phase of Gervonta Davis's career. Well, yeah, it's a new phase in some ways, but not in others. He may have left Leonard and he might have left Floyd, but he's still on Showtime. And he's still with Al Heyman. Do you think that Al Heyman views the commercial value of those fights as being the same as the commercial value of a Garcia fight? You know the answer. Underneath it all, you know the answer. We all do. Stylistically, I've said it more than once. 
Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, they're both pure boxers. Economic, defensively responsible guys that only throw one or two shots at a time. They don't give you a big enough window to get off your counter shots. And Javante Davis, for the most part, he's a counter puncher. But he needs that which he can counter. He needs somebody aggressive enough to charge him and try to maul him, open up on him, so he can shoot those counter shots. Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, they're younger fighters than Javante Davis, in many ways fresher fighters, also taller and longer, they have speed of their own. Do you remember when Floyd mentioned them both by name? Singled them out specifically, saying they should just leave Gervonta Davis alone and let him do his own thing. I mean, why do you think he singled them out? Even if Gervonta Davis isn't with Floyd and Leonard anymore, why specifically? Why did he mention them and not Ryan Garcia? Floyd knows what time it is. He knows what he's looking at. He knows his boxing. He may not have turned out to be the greatest promoter, but he was the best fighter of his era. And he may understand better than most that stylistically, both Devin and Shakur present unique challenges for Gervonta that he actually hasn't faced. I mean, how many pure boxers has he been opposite the ring with? Leo Santa Cruz ain't no pure boxer. At best, he's a mid-range to inside volume puncher. Isaac Cruz, he's a pressure fighter. Gamboa, Gamboa was over the hill in Mario Barrios. Aside from being taller than Gervonta, that guy was never any good to begin with. Neither was Roly Romero. That kid's a fucking retard. These are not pure boxers. Now, Jose Pedraza, many years ago, a boxer puncher. He is. You know, Gervonta Davis fought that guy knock that guy out. Not a pure boxer, but still a skilled boxer. A good boxer puncher. I still think that's the best scalp on Javante Davis's resume. But you're lying to yourself if you tell yourself that the competition got better after that. It didn't. It nosedived. It progressively got softer and softer to the point to where I don't think Javante Davis would know what to do opposite the ring a good, pure boxer. He hasn't come up against that style before. I don't know that Shakur Stevenson or Devin Haney will ever get the chance to share the ring with Javante Davis because if by some chance he were to beat Hector and he were to beat Ryan... Even if he's not with Floyd Mayweather anymore, Al Heyman's protective cocoon around this fighter would become that much thicker if he emerged the victor in those two fights. You think Al Heyman is chomping at the bit to make more fights with Top Rank after he saw what Fury did to Wilder? What Better Beef did to Brown? What Vozdick did to Stevenson? Adonis Stevenson. You think Al Heyman wants to make more fights with Bob? Yeah, right.